Hey, Okim students, Ben Asman here. Today we're gonna to be doing the reduction of T-butyl cyclohexanone. Let's get to it. The reduction of aldehydes and ketones is an important synthetic step on many different pathways. Remember, for oxidation, we add more oxygen bonds, and for reduction, we remove them, or add more hydrogen bonds. For us today, we're going to go from a ketone down to a secondary alcohol. Today, we'll be starting with T-butyl cyclohexanone, and please, when you're drawing the T-butyl group, remember this bond. Every time a student draws a pentavalent carbon, another chemist loses his wings. Now, our main reagent for today is sodium borohydride, which is just a source of hydrides. Remember, a hydride is just an H- with a lone pair. This nucleophilic hydrogen will then attack the electrophilic carbon on the carbonyl. If it attacks from above, that leads to one product and from below to another. And of these two, the most stable will be the major product. Last step is adding some dilute HCl to protonate the alcohol, because if we use concentrated, we might get some elimination and substitution reactions. Once again, we're gonna be using the five mil conical vial. To this, we want to add our ketone starting material. Now this stuff clumps up a lot, so go in small batches. And don't forget to record how much you took. Now this will be a room temperature reaction, so you don't really need the sand bath. And because we're gonna need the magnetic stir, make sure you position your vial exactly in the center of the hot plate. Forward, back, left, right. Add your triangular spin vane, point down, Otherwise, once again, it won't spin fast enough. Next, you'll need a cap with a hole and a septa. Septa comes in two colors, usually this fleshy or this reddish one. Pick one of them, put it inside the cap, and screw that onto the vial, but loosely. We want some room for gases to escape. Next, your instructor will prepare the sodium borohydride solution. They will do this by dissolving borohydride in very dry ethanol. Now, the borohydride does not fully go into solution, which is why we occasionally have to vigorously shake it. You can see this by how the solution is cloudy. Then, using a syringe and a needle, your instructor will measure out the desired amount of borohydride solution. You can then pierce the septum and inject the solution into the vial. You can see the reaction gets going quite quickly. There is a little bit of water which is reacting as well. Get your spin main stirring as fast as is stable. The water and the HCl we're about to add both will react in a similar way to any leftover borohydride as they are both an easy source of H+. H- attacks H+, you get H2. It's a gas and bubbles out. Because of this, after your 30 minutes have elapsed and you're adding your one mil of HCl, you wanna do it with a pipette. If you just pour it in, it might overreact. And that's not usually a pretty picture. I mean, this was just a demo and it still took several minutes to clean up, let alone if you lost any of your product. So because a pipette does not fit in a graduated cylinder, we're gonna pour it into an Elemire and then pipette it out and dropwise add it to the solution. This is roughly the speed. Just one drop at a time. But if it's not overreacting, you can go a little bit faster. Now to perform a micro extraction, we're gonna add DCM as our organic phase to our aqueous solution. Cap the vial, stir on high to merge the two phases. Once they're thoroughly homogenous, turn off the stirring and slowly let it separate into its two different phases. Next, you'll need a 10 mil Elemire. Now, as DCM is denser than water, our organic phase is on the bottom. We wanna grab our pipette, push out a little air, slowly push it through to the organic phase, push out a little bit more air, and then suck up only the lower organic phase. Notice I have my Elemire nice and close, so it's very easy to transfer. We're gonna repeat this process twice more, adding more DCM, capping, Stirring vigorously to mix, stopping the stirring, letting it settle, pipetting out the lower organic phase. Then once again, more DCM, more stirring to mix, waiting for separation again, extracting the bottom phase again. We are then gonna dry this solution using a little bit of sodium sulfate. Now the exact amount you need will change from student to student, time to time. As we discussed before, when you're using a drying agent, you're looking for three criteria. There should be no visible water droplets. It should be clear, not cloudy. And at least some of your drying agent should be still loose at the bottom. That might be easier to see from below. Very good. Now we wanna pre-weigh a vial with a boiling chip. And then to do a filtration, we'll set up a funnel with a small piece of cotton rolled into a ball and pressed in just tight enough to stopper the hole. Pour the dried solution through the filter. And then using DCM, as always, we're gonna rinse the previous container with a little bit more solvent, swirl, and then filter it as well. Our next goal is to boil off our solvent so we only have our compound left. We'll use a rubber thermometer adapter on a thermometer to make sure that it's held in place. Clamp it too high so you can adjust the angles and then lower it into the sand bath. You still wanna be able to see just a little triangle of blue. The good zone to be in is between 70 and 90, but definitely keep it under 100. Then take off your cap and push your vial deep into the sand bath. Even if your sand is hot, this is gonna take quite a while. So make sure you lower your hood to the mark so you don't breathe in any toxic fumes. Once bubbling has stopped, you should have a thick oil that will solidify into a semi-solid once cooled. 
Once you weigh this, we use infrared spectroscopy to confirm you got your product. Spectroscopy from Spectrum uses a variety of wavelengths of light to determine something about a molecule. In general, the way this works is that certain frequencies of light will excite a vibration in certain molecules or bonds, but not in others, where other frequencies of light will excite other bonds of molecules, but not the original. All we have to do is measure how much light makes it through for each frequency. Now, NIR spectrum measures the percent transmittance on the y-axis and the wave number on the x. Percent transmittance is just how much light is made through. The wave number is analogous to frequency or energy and has a unit of inverse meters. Unlike most spectrometry where we look at peaks that go up, in IR we look at dips or peaks that go down. For this lab, there's three main frequencies that you care about. An alcohol's OH bond, whose peak is broad and shows up in the mid-3000s. CH bonds, which are all plus or minus a little bit from 3000, and are usually pretty sharp. Though their position does depend on whether they are alkanes, alkenes, or alkynes. And carbonyls, like ketones, that show up in the mid to late teens. This is our IR spectrometer. You want to start off by cleaning the surface and the head of the lever with a little bit of solvent and a chem wipe. If your compound is a liquid, you can just take some out and cover the little black eye of the device. However, if your compound is a solid, like our starting material is here, after you cover the eye, you'll have to move the lever over and crank it down into place to apply some pressure. Then, assuming your instructor has already done the background, you will type your name under sample ID at the top left corner, click scan, click scan again, and a few minutes later you will have a spectrum. Then at the top left side of the screen, under Data Explorer, you should see a file with your name on it. Click on it to open your spectrum. To label the important major peaks, hover over the peak you want to label, right click, and press Label This Point. Then press OK, and you should have a label that you can move to where you need it. Repeat as necessary. Then click File, Print, and you are done.